Good afternoon and we welcome all participants and guests present in today's Podomoro Design Festival 3.0 webinar titled Metamorph in Disguise, Architecture of Impact. To begin this webinar, I would like to explain the rules of this webinar. First, attend the event in a good and comfortable position, dress appropriately, enter the room in 10 minutes before the webinar commence. Turn on the video and turn off your microphone during the event, follow the rundown that has been arranged by the committee. Eating during, during the event is prohibited, doing another activities during the event is prohibited. Regarding certificate, there will, there will be a link at the end of this webinar that leads to the evaluation form of the event. After, after filling the form, your certificate will be sent through your email. Before we start the show, we ask all participants present to sing with us the anthem of Podomoro University. Cha, 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 cha. Perancang gagasan Jadikan pendidikan Sebagai pedoman Kami mahasiswa Mahasiswi berbudi Sang penjaga budaya Wujudkan harmoni to invite Mr. Adli Nadia as the, as the head of architecture and graduate program of Podomoro University. Mr. Adli Nadia, time and place is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, and Good Afternoon. Dearest Mr. Ken Young, our teacher, Ms. Tani Nabel, Chairman of the Architecture Students Associations in Baltimore University, Mr. Louis, the Chairman of the Committee, Ms. Maria, Vice Rector, Ms. Yasseri, our moderator, and uh, Mr. Ricky Cahyadi, Media Partner, Archify, and last but not least, 100 architect and planners below. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my great pleasure and honored to welcome you all at the opening ceremony of Metamorph in this guy's webinar on the topic architectures of impact. 
role within architectural ecological design has been in our blood for the last two decades. Big thanks to Mr. Ken Young as the most significant influence for students and teachers. Since almost then, the ecological design was implemented everywhere and anytime. The impact of environmental design can be felt and improves our social lives nowadays. As a tropical country, we don't have much complexities compared to the subtropical countries. We don't need cooling and heating to be happening at the same time. But we have the biggest challenge, is, uh, which is to preserve water and energy as consequences. Especially in Indonesia, having the right concept of preserving energy can have a significant impact on the economy on, and our people. Indonesia nowadays develops more cities than other countries in Southeast Asia. Indonesia also spent a huge amount of money to build infrastructures from Sabang to Marauke. And on the other hand, Indonesia also had the broadest cultural heritage that not only need to be preserved, but also act as identity. Soon, we will face the most complex design issues related to sustainable design and critical regionalism in Asia. So, how is the future of ecological-based design that we need and how to implement it? Hopefully this seminar will or can give an overview to us as students and teachers as guidance and inspire us our, and inspire our research path and strategy to enrich our new development of Indonesian cities. I wish the webinar uh, be successful and reach its goals as I mentioned. And it's been an honor to welcome you, Mr. Ken Young. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dapita. Thank you so much, Mr. Adli Nadia, for your speech. And next, may I invite Ms. Tan Inabel Kristanza as the head of student organization of architecture for the University. Ms. Inabel, your time and place is yours. Okay, thank you, Jansen and Davita. Good afternoon. I'm Inabel Crisanza on behalf of Architecture Student Organization of Podomoro University. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our very first international webinar on Metamorph in Disguise Architecture on Impact as the series of our third annual event for the Moro Design Festival 3.0. I'm honored to welcome the speaker today, the internationally renowned eco-architect Dr. Dr. Ken Young. We are very grateful to have you as our speaker today. I would like to express my appreciation to all of the Himars PU team members and all the lecturers and staff who sincerely committed to this event to make it a success. This event would have been impossible without the support of each and every one person here. As we all have known, today we will talk about Metamorph in disguise and its impact on architecture. Changes and innovations are still happening, but now we cannot see them clearly. The whole metamorphosis in architecture seems disguised by too many things, too many ways, and described situations and unnecessary interpretations. And today we will find out what is this phenomenon, because we are the ones who should be responsible for this disguise. Finally, I hope the next few hours will be enjoyable and fruitful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Inabel, for your speech. And now we'll hear the presentation from our media partner, Archify, to Mr. Ricky Cahyadi. Time and place is yours. Hello. Can you all hear? Hello. Hi, everyone. Yes, Hi. yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, uh, uh, Adli and yes. Mr. Yang. Nice to meet you all and uh, everybody in the uh, event. Uh, introduce, uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm uh, Ricky, co-founder of uh, Archify.com. Um, I think, first of all, I would like to congratulate for HIMARS, for the Moro University, uh, on hosting this uh, very first international webinar and also organizing the uh, Podomoro Design Festival. So congratulations. 
Uh, I would like to take a short time before we all uh, listen to Mr. Ken Yang. Uh, I would like to share a little bit about Archify to uh, all of the friends over here. So maybe I'll share my screen. Uh, quick one. One second. Okay, uh, there you go. So I'll just share out briefly about what Archify is all about. We are a platform that uh, powered by BCI Asia and focus on design professional actually. So I, I myself, uh, I personally having a background in architecture as well. So I used to be an architect for about five years before I moved to digital uh, industry. So I'm interested to uh, how we can support design professional like architect, interior designers all uh, through digital media. So what we try to do is to create an ecosystem where we connect uh, people like us, design professional with property owner on one side and uh, another side with uh, product supplier. So it creates like a ecosystem in a way, a digital ecosystem where we all, we connect all the stakeholders in the construction industry. So that's what Archify is about. And at the moment we are in, a, uh, have, have gone international. So we, we are uh, uh, live in a, the other different countries like Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Philippines. So if you all go to archify.com and change the flag on the top right corner, which I'll show you later on, you can see different uh, architects, firms, and professionals and uh, building materials from these uh, different countries, right? Uh, okay, there are a couple of main features that we have, uh, mainly are these four list of professionals from different countries, uh, inspiration photos from uh, projects that has been uploaded by different professionals. And we've got uh, a range of uh, thousands of uh, product building materials that you can see and with the specification and all that. And lastly, we have Archify now, which is our media arm. So at the moment, like we have partnership with uh, Podomoro University is through Archify now, where we help to publish uh, the event. And the next one, we've got a couple of design tools as well that I think is very uh, interesting for uh, architects, friends. Uh, one is we have my library. Number two, we have design folder and then mood board. And lastly, the spec sheet. So I'll show you briefly on the actual Archify Live uh, uh, website so you can understand more. So I'll stop sharing quickly and I'll just... Uh, go to the website, yeah. So as you, you all can see later on, uh, you can click on archify.com slash ID. So basically we have five main tab. We, what you can do here is to see range of products for your project with all the specification. If you click one of these uh, uh, products and we've got 14 uh, main category where you can find different types of product here and then you can see also for you, let's say you just graduate and you wanna uh, find architecture or design firm to work in, you can find all the lists here. We've got thousands of architecture firm and interior design firm where you can apply for work and see their portfolio. And you yourself can actually upload your own work. Uh, we've got also inspiration. This is like a breakdown from the, uh, how do I call it? like the breakdown from the project uploaded into different rooms. So you can, uh, like end user can easily find uh, different inspiration, like a Pinterest, but all Indonesian project, or let's say Australian project, Singapore project. And this is the article where we always publish the latest uh, project from uh, various architecture firm around the region. Uh, you can check it out yourself after this. Uh, and I think the, the last two things I would like to share, just to keep it short, is the two, uh, interesting design tools that we provide for free and for everybody to use to, to design. One of them is Moodbot that we have. So as you can see here, uh, okay, this is, uh, for example, the kind of Moodbot that I've done using Archify.com. So you can just easily log in and uh, sign up as an individual. And this is what we can do within the platform itself. So it's basically like a PowerPoint or your, uh, Corel Draw or Illustrator, Photoshop and all that. But the difference is that you can easily find all the images and the products within the Archify itself. So for instance, I'm looking for HPL product here. 
So I'll just uh, search and then all the HPL product available in Indonesia are listed here. So you can just drag and drop and, and put it all here easily. So you can save and come back anytime to access this. And um, okay, I'll just exit without save. The last one that is very interesting uh, for you to use is the spec sheet. So this, so the mood board that you've created normally on uh, PowerPoint or, or Illustrator, you have to shift all the product specification manually to let's say Microsoft Word or Excel sheet, right? You have to write down, type in a key in manually again, but the difference in uh, Artify.com is that you can actually create create a spec sheet just within a one click away. So I'm creating, for instance, a spec sheet based on the mood board that I've created just now. And voila, uh, it's all there. So very simple. You don't have to uh, type in again manually. And uh, this is the preview from all the product I've put in into my mood board. So the specification all there, all you need to do is just uh, print it out in a A4 paper. Yeah, so yeah, I think to keep it short, uh, I'll, I'll stop my sharing here. I think it's quite straightforward. So, and it's it's pretty easy to, to actually explore the platform on your own on archify.com slash ID. And uh, lastly, you can also follow our uh, Instagram at uh, archify.now. Yeah, uh, so happy exploring. I think that will be all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ricky Cahyadi uh, and Jensen. Okay, that's all of the information regarding this webinar. To Mrs. Yasri Dahlia Pritasari as the moderator, the time and place is given. Thank you, Davita and Jensen. Good afternoon, all participants. Thank you for joining this webinar with the team Metamorph in Disguise. I am Yasari Dahlia Apritasari as the moderator of today's event. Firstly, on behalf of Podomoro University, I would like to say thank you for our special guest speaker, Dr. Ken Yang for his time to share and present his architecture knowledge and experience. The agenda will be divided in two sessions. The first session, presentation by Dr. Ken Yang, approximately 45 minutes. The second session, Q&A, about 30 minutes. The second session, for participants who will deliver question, you can drop your question in the live chat section on YouTube, right in the in chat column, and then committee will choose the question. Before Dr. Yang's presentation, I would like to present his curriculum vitae. Dr. Yang is international acclaimed and eco-architect. His work has won more than 70 awards by integrating architecture with ecology. Dr. Yang, not only an architect, but also an ecologist, planner, and author for over 12 books, best known for his ecological architecture and eco master plans that have a distinctive green aesthetics. He pioneered an ecology based architecture since 1971, working on the theory and practice of sustainable design. Dr. Yang studied architecture and ecological design in the AA Architectural Association School, UK. And he received his doctorate from Cambridge University with his dissertation, a theoretical of framework for incorporation of ecological consideration in the design and planning. His key building include uh, Suasana Putrajaya, Malaysia Achievement GBA certified, extension, Create Ormond Street Children's Hospital, Achievement UK Braham Excellent, 
Singapore National Library, Singapore, Menara Mesin Niaga, Malaysia, Achievement Agakan Award, The Roof Roof House, Malaysia, Solaris Tower, Singapore, Achievement Green Rock Platinum, and many building and award. And the last, the Guardian newspaper, 2008, named him one of the 50 people who called Save the Planet. I would like to invite Dr. Yang to do presentation. Please, Dr. Yang, the time is yours. Boss. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, can you put my slides on? Where? No, you see. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing for the last um, few decades on designing for a resilient planet. My work is different from other green architects in that it is based on, the, in that it is ecocentric, that it is based on the principles of ecology or the science of ecology. Now, ecology sees the earth that's covered by this thin film, which is called the biosphere. And within this biosphere is where organisms live. And within this biosphere are units in nature, which are called ecosystems. And ecosystems consist of communities of plants and animals, and also a physical environment. And ecosystem consists of these two constituents acting together to form a whole. And so community of plants and animals consists of, of plants, animals, uh, and uh, microbes, and also the physical environment is the site character, characterized, characterized by a given climatic features, and the, they are site character, characterized by given soil features, so edaphic features. So one is biotic and the other one is abiotic, organic and inorganic. Now, these different components, parts of it, interact with each other in very complex ways. The animal communities and the plant communities act together with climate, with the hydrological processes, with the soils and geology of the locality. So the ecosystem is actually a very complex unit um, to understand. Now, added to this is us as human communities. Now we are a, one of the species in nature, but we are different because we, we are the most powerful of all species. Uh, we can change the landscapes, we can change um, the flow of rivers by dams, we can change um, the, the, the waterfront, uh, we can change the uh, global climate. And we, we've done this willy nilly, we've done this to an extent that, that human life and all species on earth are under threat. And ecologists, many ecologists say that we have only about 10 or 30 years left. And so we don't have very much time, 10 to 30, 30 years will just go just like that. And so we have to do something about it now. Now within this is our built environment. We make things. Built environments, not just buildings, but also um, artifacts, um, cars, toys, computers. And so, in fact, we make more things than anybody else in any other species in nature. And this is what makes us different. Now, put these together, then what has happened now is that there's ineffective biointegration 
between our human communities and the built environment. And because of this ineffective biointegration, um, the outcome, the impairment of the, of the biosphere is increasingly severe. That to the extent that, you know, we are now changing the climate, the sea, the changing the, the, the levels of the sea, we're changing the, the, the temperature of many of, of the parts of the world. And very soon, even the cold climates will become, will become Mediterranean. Now, to me, everything depends on effective biointegration. If biointegration is ineffective, that is the cause of um, environmental impairment. And so then I thought, what happens? What if we make our built environment like ecosystems? That's what I call constructed ecosystems. What if our human society is egocentric? We believe we act in a responsible ecological way. And then in this way, designing buildings, uh, we should design our built systems to be like ecosystems as what I call constructed ecosystems. Now, this is the first idea I want to present to you. And this idea that's been in my mind for many, many years and trying to interpret this in our work is one of the most difficult things that I try to achieve. And so what happens, we bring the two together, we integrate, we bi-integrate uh, ecosystems, our human communities, our built environment as constructed ecosystems. And so designing then starts at the scale of infrastructure. So this is the second idea I want to present to you and, and not incremental built systems. That means we, we look at the infrastructure as a whole and not just doing individual buildings here and there. Now, this is, this is the city of today. We have infrastructure and we have, um, you know, buildings, you know, cluttered all over it, you know, we built buildings. And then architects now build green buildings. So the red dots represent green buildings that are architects. But to me, this is ineffective because it's only local. The impact is only local because the infrastructure, if it's not green, nothing, then nothing else we do is green. So that means the important point I want to make that I want to leave in your mind firstly, is that we have to start with the green infrastructure. Once you start with the green infrastructure, then anything else you add to it, that makes it increasingly green and makes it much easier to make the whole environment green. And so the first idea I want to put in your head is that we should start designing not individual building, not just individual buildings to make them green, but we should design green infrastructure. And so with this idea, I started to, 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 to ask myself, what are the key infrastructures that we have to take into consideration in design? To me, nature itself is an infrastructure. It is the baseline, the base where everything takes place. And then the second is the water. Water is part of nature, but it is so important because what is what life is all about. You know, when astronomers look into the stars or into Mars, the first thing to look at is, is there any water there? If there's signs of water, then there's, there, there is signs of organic life. And so water and the water management, the regime is, a, is, a, is an infrastructure. And water is not just rainwater, but it also includes rivers and seas and lakes and, and, and groundwater. And then there's us as human beings, you know, we have, we are infrastructure, our social, economic, political, institutional system itself makes an infrastructure. Then the fourth infrastructure is our built environment. Our built environment infrastructure is not just external, the roads, the drains, the sewage, the bridges, but also everything's inside the building, the electrical systems, the sewage system, water systems. So there's internal infrastructure, there's external infrastructure. Then architectural design for me, ecological design, is how to bring all these together into a whole, how to bi-integrate nature with water, with human beings, our society, and with built environment. In a nutshell, this is what architecture or ecological design is about. Now for, for convenience sake, I call nature green because it's green, this color green, and then our human society is red because it's the color of blood and then water is blue and the built environment gray. And so ecological design is by integrating all these four eco infrastructures into a whole. So nature, human society, hydrology and technology. Now, this by integration has to be seamless, it has to be you know, as close together that you cannot see the joints, 
has to be benign because it should not affect the uh, further deficit environment and should be harmonious. And if you lay it out, these are, these are the key factors, nature's utilities and resources, there's an ecological, you know, we can use ecological corridors, we need to re reconnect nature, um, human societies and lifestyles, and so forth. These are the key factors in ecological design. So ecological design isn't that easy. It is not, it's very complex. And, and that it is something that, that, that we cannot solve all at once, but we, we just have to do it to the best of our ability. So now this is a project that we, we a master plan that we did in uh, Bangalore in India. And on the right hand side, or the, well actually it's the west side of the site is the forest reserve. And our, our first thing that we did was to create the green infrastructure. And so we create a spine that collects all the species along the forest reserve. And then we stretch it right across the site so that the, the, the species and the green infrastructure can connect adjoining sites. And so by doing this, we extend it through ecological corridors, the ecological fingers across the entire site to link to the other sites so that then nature is reconnected because what we as human beings do is that we fragment the site. We go to a piece of land, we chop it up, just, you know, and break it up into little pieces. And then we separate them and, and you know, by rows, by, by, by fences, by impervious surfaces, by, by buildings. So one of the key things we have to do as an ecological designer is to reconnect nature, to bring nature together and, and, and try and reconnect the planet reconnect the ecosystems that we have chopped up and fragmented. So now this, this is the flat, the flattened version of what you saw, this is the master plan. And so first thing that we did was to connect, have a, a spine that collects all the species, and then we spread across the site to connect to other joining site. So this to me is the green infrastructure. And to me, ecological design starts with defining the green infrastructure. If you don't have this green infrastructure, then, then you have a technological or any other infrastructure, but we must start with the green infrastructure. And then from this, we lay other things. We lay the uh, roads, we lay the uh, water, uh, water systems, and then we have, uh, then you have the human societal systems, our communities, our, 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 our paths, our open spaces. And so if we're able to create an environment as a constructive ecosystem that emulates and replicate attributes ecosystem, then what we have is that two ecosystems that integrate with each other in a seamless benign way. And so that is the basic principle for me of ecological design. So by bringing this together, what we have then is to, to uh, build environments in constructed ecosystem. Now making this constructed ecosystem means we have to emulate and replicate the attributes of ecosystems you know, to become, if you like, in you know, a constructed ecosystem. So what are the properties and attributes of ecosystems that we need to emulate. So this, I started to think about this and these are some of the things that we need to, 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 to emulate in as much as possible. Not just emulate, we need to replicate if we can. For instance, ecosystems, the biological structure that I mentioned earlier on, of biotic, abiotic constituents. You know, ecosystems have a high level of biodiversity. Ecosystems are connected and there's an ecological nexus. Um, ecosystems provide ecosystem services uh, without uh, any intervention by human beings. Ecosystems are biointegrated, they respond to climate. Um, ecosystems, materials within ecosystems are cyclical and, 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 and not a throughput system where our human existing human society, a human built environment is a throughput system where we take materials from somewhere use it, employ it, make use of it, and then we throw it away. Of course, you know, if, you, if, you know, if you look at the planet as a whole, there's no way, everything stays back in this planet. And so we need to close the cycle. We must close the, the loop as much as possible. Ecosystems of hydrology that we need to uh, understand and, 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 and give value to it. Ecosystems of symbiotic, all the components, you know, is ecosystems um, interact and benefit each other. These ecosystems have very high feedback system, the internal ecosystems, which are called hemostasis. Ecosystems you know, produce its own food, whereas we produce food from somewhere, we, you know, we bring from somewhere, then we process it, treat it, and then we throw it away again. 
And so whereas nature you know, produces its own food in its own location and ecosystems develop is grow in the throes of, throes of in a process of succession. So these are some of the characteristics of an ecosystem. These are some of the attributes of ecosystems. If we try and emulate as much as we can, we should try and replicate if possible. And this is what drives my work. Now, this is a tall order. I'm not going to achieve this in my lifetime. And I hope that some of you will help me achieve this and look at the ecosystem, look at its attributes, and see how we can um, emulate it and replicate it. Now, the first property is the biological structure. As I mentioned earlier on, um, ecosystems consist of biotic constituents and abiotic constituents acting together to form a whole. Now, for a holistic property is extremely important because this is what separates organisms and biological systems from mechanical systems. Mechanical systems, you know, even though they, they are they're connected, you know, they, are, they, they, they don't act holistically. If you take out one part of an ecosystem, it can be easily replaced, but you can't do that with an ecosystem. You know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you take one part, it will never be the same again. And so the holistic property is very important. But then, you know, then it occurred to me as I started to think about emulating and, and replicating ecosystems, it occurred to me that almost an, our entire existing food environment that's mostly abiotic. Then where is the biotic system, systems? And so our built environment is incomplete. It can never be an ecological system unless we, we add in the biotic constituents and not just put this in. We have to make sure they integrate and interact with each other as a whole. And so that, that was the first idea that, that stuck in my head. And then I started to look at patterns where we can bring you know, the greenery, the body constituents into the built environment. You can, you know, in the first diagram on the left hand side, you put it all in one location as in Central Park in New York, or you can have a dispersed system, a series of squares as in Georgia and London. We have Tavistock Square, Euston Square, Bedford Square, or you can have a series of connected green areas, which are not quite connected. I call them stepping stones because if they're connected, then they're connected, but the stepping stone means that they are close. Species can move from one part to the other part with some difficulty, but not connected. But ideal pattern is the one on the right-hand side where you have equal corridors and series of fingers that eat into the built environment, integrating the organic with the inorganic. In the built environment, in the buildings, you can see the lower set of diagrams, one location on the left-hand side, a spotty relationship, as you can see in the second one, a stepping stone relationship in the third, and then the continuous spiraling interconnected. But ecologists contend that the last one is preferred because by being connected, you have a, a, a shared pool of resources for species, and this engenders a much more stable uh, a, a level ecosystem of a, a, a stable a habitat. You have a greater um, higher level of biodiversity, and species can move from one part to the other part without being fragmented, without being stopped by any impervious inorganic services. And so with these ideas, with these patterns, I started to do my early work maybe 10, 20 years ago. But not only should we connect it at the ground level, we should connect it vertically as well. And so in this way, then the connection with nature, the connecting with the hinterland is not just you know, at the ground plane, not just up to the edge of the building, but all the way inside the building, all the way up to the top of the building. So this was, if you like, a, a, an ambition of, of the work that I do. And so from there, I started to, to look into ways we could do this. This was a, the scheme that we designed in Singapore. It's not built, it's not built. It's a competition I didn't win. But the idea was to have a, a ramp that goes all the way up the building. So that in this way, um, you know, it's a continuous ramp and that all the floors are interconnected. And, and so, this, uh, uh, so, that we, so that in this way, the, the, the vegetation, the, the biotic constituents are integrated with the abiotic vertically in a connected way. Now, I, I, I'm you know, extremely disappointed that I didn't win a competition, but you know, it was an idea and, and this idea you know, stuck my mind. And, and it took me about five to 10 years later to able to build something like this. Now, so this is the, another image of the building. And the idea then, they also had the idea that the building itself then becomes the catalyst becomes a way of making the city green. 
so that whenever the, the ramp reaches the, the roof level of a joining building, a bridge across the joining building and green it. So in this way, progressively, the whole city becomes green, but it's just an idea, you know, it's, it's never been implemented. And I'm not sure whether anybody will implement it. So the next thing that I, I, want, I wanted to look at this eco, ecosystems connect, connectivity and nexus, because in nature, everything's connected. There are no boundaries. The boundaries are, in fact, the boundaries that we have are either natural boundaries, uh, which even though they, they consider natural boundaries, is still much of it is still connected both at the ground and in the air. But it's us as human beings that chop nature up, the fragmented and, 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 and disconnect nature. And so a lot of our work then is with, besides building the green infrastructure is to reconnect nature and to make nature whole again. Now, so the idea then was that if we bring the vegetation all the way up the building, and then if we're able to, to have it in the, in, the, in the outside of the building, in this way where we have, you know, a connected vegetation ramp, and then put a corridor, a walkway next to it, so that people can service the vegetation and can, and can water it and can replace, you know, uh, those which are affected, uh, which are impaired. Um, without going through the office space, without going into the internal spaces. So this, if you like, was inspira uh, as inspirational drawing for me, where the idea was to have the vegetation on one side, to continuously go all the, all the way up the building, and then a walkway as a ramp that goes all the way up. And so this was, this was, this was the idea, which started with the earlier comp you know, competition scheme that I did um, uh, in Waterloo Road. Eventually, it took me about you know five to eight years to get it built, and here it is. The building you can see the vegetation, you can see the walkway. If you walk, you can see the facade, and you can see the sun shading on top. And this is the building that we did in Singapore about you know five eight years ago. And the idea was that the ramp climbs every floor. With every facade, I climb one floor, and so this continuously weaves its way up to the top of the building. And there it is. You know, this is the building on the right hand side. In the context of of, um, of one north, this is a district, and the two very tall buildings on the left hand side are by Kisho Kurkawa, the famous Japanese architect, his very close friend who died about five years ago. So now this is the ramp. You can see it ramps up, and the vegetation goes up. You can see the vegetation, the walkway, and the, and that uh, the mid level have a roof garden. Then it continues all the way up. To, to a room, to, you know, you have a mid-level garden and then one more at the top of the building. And so these are the floor plans, it's the basement level and, and that. I call this a linear park because if you walk all the way around in tunis, continuously to the top, it is a park. But rather than, it's a bit boring, so what I've done is I've cut out the corners, as you can see in the bottom diagram, and created sky courts. So it's like little plazas. You know, you have this continuous ramp, then you have little plazas as you go up. And these are the plazas, which are at the corners where you can interact with people. You can actually go out and people on the inside of the building can go out and have a cigarette. On the right hand side is a project I'm working in London where, where the whole building consists of that's a step part sky courts. And this is one of these sky courts where people can go out. They can, you know, they can have coffee there. They can have the breakfast. They can have the, the lunch and they can have a cigarette if they, if they wish. And that it, this links by the walkway Throughout, throughout the whole top of the building. But the building is actually two components. There's a block on the left and right hand side linked by this common facade. And that um, yeah, this is the roof garden, the uppermost roof garden. And, uh, and from here, there's a terrific view of the whole, um, whole locality. Now, in Singapore, there's an index called the Green Index. And that for me, the, the accreditation system uh, it's only a guide, it's only an indication. So the requirement in Singapore is six. And as you can see here, we've got 12. We, we, we doubled the, 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 the requirement you know, of, the, of, the, of the Green Mark uh, certification system. So you should treat LEED, you should need Green Mark, you should treat CASB and all the accreditation systems. That's just a guide, it's just a standard. You know, that doesn't mean that, you know, you achieve the standard and that's it. You should try to surpass it as much as we can. So in this way, then we try and make our buildings greener and greener and greener, you know, for the benefit of humankind. Now, between the two blocks is an atrium. The atrium then becomes a space where we naturally ventilate the space. And then up the, above the atrium, I have louvers, which are operable. 
you can see that you know on a normal day the air can go out, and then you know on it rains it automatically shuts because it has sensors, and that this is the louvers when they're shut and it's looking up from the atrium, and here it is with all the louvers open, you know on, on a normal day, and here it is you know it's shut, and so in this way uh, it is uh, open to the sky space as a natural ventilator. But obviously, it reduces the energy consumption in this whole building. But uh, you still need to have some cool air blow into it to keep the environment cool. Now, the two blocks are linked by bridges. And so this is the bridge that link the two blocks. And you can see the atrium in the middle. And then uh, here's the bridge. And that. Uh, then we have a number of experiments. One experiment is to have a light shaft, which is diagonally cut through the floor. So you can see the diagonal. But it's not through the entire floor, it's only part of the floor. This is an experiment. So you can see this little red square, which goes all the way down. And you're looking up, you can see the sky, you can see the balconies, you can see the other floors, and it's looking down. So from inside, you can actually go down and see the street. Now, this is the simulation of the uh, daylight penetration. It's not very good. You know, you can see that dark areas, but we need, you know. I have to give the excuse that I, I optimize the floor area because of the climb. But I, ideally, we should try and bring as much daylight to the inner parts of the building. In certain parts of the world, like in Germany, no, the glass to glass distance is about 17 meters, so that the middle of the floor you can get daylight in. But here, the glass to glass is, uh, distance is quite high. And this is looking up the diagonal light shaft. Then this is where the, sh the light shafts is in the little red square in the middle plan. Now, I wanted to bring the, the uh, vegetation, the greenery, the biotic constituents, not just to the ground floor, but into the basement as well, into the lowest part. So I call this the eco cell because you know, this is, becomes a cell-like structure, and this is where it goes down. And this is, this is what the eco cell looks like. It reaches the ground floor and then spirals all the way around down to the basement. And so the next thing I wanted to do was see how we could enhance the biodiversity of the locality. And so this is a project we did in Putrajaya, which is the capital city in Kuala Lumpur, and it's next to the uh, uh, important bridge. And we finished this about, about a year ago. And the approach to enhance the biodiversity is to create habitats within the buildings. Habitats of, uh, of homes or species, which are can green roofs, the vertical green walls, it could be uh, green sky cows, it could be green atriums, it could be constructed wetland, it can pockets of greenery in the ground, and it goes all the way down to the basin, as you can see in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the bottom right hand side. Now the project is basically two blocks uh, with a with a plaza in between. And the plaza actually is an axis from the uh, roundabout all the way down to the, uh, to the Millennium Monument, which is also designed by us. But so these are the habitats. You can see you know, the red square on the ground plane, the habitats on above the building, habitats on the side of the building, habitats you know, going up to the building. And then with every project, we look at, a, at a, the, the biodiversity of locality. And this project is about 2.9 degrees above the crater. So it's very high level biodiversity. As you can see, it gets increasingly less as you hit towards the you know, uppermost atmosphere and, 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 and less as you go downwards from the equator. So now our technique for doing this is what we call a setting a biodiversity target. And so you can see in the diagram on the left hand side, on the top axis are all the habitats we create in the building. Then on the left-hand axis are the species that we want to attract back to the site, which are not hazardous human beings, the faunal species. From there, we then select the floral species that will attract the faunal species. And then from there, we look at the interaction with the habitats, with the species, with the floral species, and all together, then we use this as a basis for landscape design. So we call this uh, uh, our technique to try and enhance the biodiversity locality because the site that was given to us, is the land has been cleared, all the forest that, you know, that, that has been on it has been removed. And all you see on the site before we went on it is just red soil. So we need to bring back native species 
species which are non-invasive back to locality and species which are not hazardous human beings. And so, you know, this way, uh, this was the project and that uh, the building is that red square, the white square you can see there, that lies along a boulevard, a very important boulevard because it leads all the way down to the bottom, which is the prime minister's office. And there it is, and next to it is the bridge, and that the access is from the roundabout going all the way down. On the right, on the far right is a monument uh, which faces the waterfront, which is also designed by us. And we designed the monument as a, as a spot because the monument was done actually about you know, eight years earlier, but the monument actually, uh, um, you know, was part of the, of the, of that, of that locality and these are the surrounding buildings to the monument. Now this is the plaza in between. And so we create little pockets of people can eat, can, can sit. And then on, on the veranda way on the right hand side uh, are food and beverage outlets where people eat and drink and, and, uh, and make the place, you know, merry and jolly. We're looking for an aesthetic and we thought maybe what we want to do is to facet the building to make it look like a diamond. So, but we didn't exactly cap it to 100% butt joint. You can see I, I have, you know, cut the nasty slices through it. So to make it look, you know, uh, much more, uh, you know, uh, less, less, I don't know, less formal. But then we punch holes in it. These are the sky cuts where we have greenery and then for the cultural aspect of it, you can see a pattern on a little white square. Uh, the pattern is a socket pattern, which is a Malay uh, a pattern weaving, or high class weaving, uh, which you know people wear. And so the pattern you can see left hand side. The middle picture, the middle image is from inside looking out. So you can so that so the, the the glass fitted glass patterns are not exactly uh, joined, but jointed. There's an air gap so the air can flow through, and and the, each of the glass panels is about fifty percent of a wet fit. Now we did this as an experiment, as alternative using horizontal louvers for sun shading. You said what happens if we use glass? What happens if we use fitted glass as the basis for sun shading? And so this was the experiment we did. And then on the drawing on the right hand side, the image on the right hand side, there's a passageway between the outer skin and the inner skin. And so you can actually service and clean both of them at the same time. Now, this is the evaluation of the uh, energy eff eff intensity. The average office building uses about 210 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. And this, the studies have shown that this building uses 138. 36, sorry, 136.18. So the idea of a fitted glass works. And so we should try and use this as an alternative horizontal sun shading, you know, uh, that we use fitted glass uh, with, a gla with, a, with a work pattern and that, you know, they're not exactly but jointed with air gaps in between. And so in many ways, a lot of our work is experimental and this was an experiment for us that, that was successful. Now, as you can see on the plan, it's basically two, you know, uh, V-shaped buildings or inverted V-shaped buildings, you know, because of the, the site isn't exactly regular and they can see the boulevard on the right-hand side. And, but on the west side, you know, to, to, to keep out the west sun, we, we didn't keep it flat, but we angled it, you know, to keep out the sun. And then uh, we brought everything down to the ground, which we call the green eco cell. Now the eco cell idea was developed uh, maybe about you know, it was about 10 years earlier when we did this master plan for the Kowloon Waterfront Competition. And so within Kowloon Waterfront Competition, we had a number of eco cells and the eco cells are voiced that cut from the top of the podium going all the way down to the basement. And that's this bring in vertical integration of vegetation, provide opportunities for rainwater harvesting, nice ventilation, brings daylight to the inner parts of the building and that it is uh, also at the bottom, we have the, the eco machine or a biosphere. And so, you know, this was developed, you know, for, this was developed, you know, about, you know, eight years before, you know, for, for this competition of the Kowloon Waterfront, which again, a competition we didn't win, uh, so that we got a commendation. So now what is the eco cell? How does it look like? So the idea was that we had a terrace on the first floor and the vegetation comes down to the side of the staircase, where you can see going all the way down. And then when it hits the ground floor, it goes spirals all the way down again, right down to the basement. 
And so the, these are quite recent pictures and, and it's you know, really green and full, you know, satisfyingly green. And so here's the building next to the important bridge and that you can see the access going all the way down. And so this was completed about a year and a half ago. And uh, it was an interesting experiment for us with the use of fritted glass as a, as a substitute for sun shading. Now, the next thing you ask is, okay, well, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a medium rise building, it's easier to, to create habitats. How do you create habitats in a high rise building? So this is a building which is now under construction. And then what we've done is that we get, create a green wall that goes all the way up to the top of the building. But the first thing we did before we designed was to research what are the green areas surrounding the site. We try to research which are the species around the area that we should try and bring back into the site. And so with this, again, we try to create habitats. These are different habitats for the building. We have a green wall, we have green terraces, we have green patches in the roof and green in the ground. And so the idea was to, to segment the, the habitats so the lower part of, of the habitats are for dragonflies, are called the dragonfly zone. And then above that will be the butterfly zone, above that will be the songbird zone, and above that will be the migratory bird zone. So these are the butterflies that, you know, the, the dragonflies you want to bring back into the lower parts of the building. And then these are the butterflies, and then these are the songbirds we want to bring to the site. And then this is the migratory birds we want to, to attract. And so this drives the selection of species Will affect, they will attract this fauna. And so in this way, the whole building that becomes, if I, we're heading towards the building as a constructed ecosystem. And so in a summary, these are the, these are the key factors that we introduce in this building. And the dotted line shows the green wall that climbs all the way up to the top of the building. Now, one of the properties of ecosystems is the provision of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are things that nature does for us without our, our asking nature to do, without our human intervention, it doesn't automatically, it's a, it, nature does it freely for us. So what are these? And it's so important to, to emulate this, but it is extremely difficult. And I'm never able to achieve this 100%, but it's something that, that you know, that is my, you know, my golden chalice. This is something I should try and do as, as much as possible. And so these are the you know, range of ecosystems. So some of it's for the benefit of human beings, some of it for locality as in a degree and the yellow of what's the benefit of nature. And so if, you know, if I linearly put it out, then these are things that nature does for us. It produces oxygen, it maintains the biology, it genetic diversity, it purifies the air water, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's this, it provides storage, cycling, and global distribution of fresh water as a regulation of chemical composition in the atmosphere. This is a whole list of things that nature does for us. Now, if we, were to, if we were to emulate and replicate this, it is impossible. It's a magnanimous, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a huge, enormous task. And so how, what can we do? Nature, for instance, produces oxygen. There's no way that we can artificially, even with the best technology in the world, with artificial intelligence, we can produce the sufficient oxygen in the quantity, in the capacity, in the quality that ma nature makes it. And then nature sequests a pollution. All the pollution, all the gases, all the carbon dioxide and monoxide that we discharge in the air, nature sequests it, nature absorbs it. But there's no way we can do it at the level nature does it. And in fact, right now, the production of, of, of pollutants in the air far exceeds the cap capability of nature to, 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 to absorb it. And therefore, you know, it's started to, you know, to, to cause climate change. A study has shown that we have only about 10 or 30 years left before the whole planet becomes totally inhabit uninhabitable. Now, it may not bother me so much because I might not be alive by then, but for you, you're the next generation. You have to do something now. You have to get people to do this. So thank God that, you know, that, that, that little girl was saying Greta Thunberg, you know, she, she is bold enough, she's courageous enough to do it. But you're the generation, you're the one who has to tell your politicians, you have to tell your government, you have to tell your people, you tell your urban planners, you tell your engineers, you tell the, you know, the whole community, you have to educate them that we have to do something now before it is too late. Now, the impact of this is invisible. You cannot see it. 
it gets, you know, it gets slowly and slowly, the aquifer is more contaminated, the water gets contaminated, the seas get polluted with plastics and all sorts of things. You know, suddenly it's too late. So please do something about it now because the generation of the future belongs to you. So now what do we do? If we cannot imitate it 100%, we cannot replicate 100%, what do we do? So the idea I had was that let's augment our built environment, use nature to augment our ability to provide ecosystem services. And so the idea was that, you know, the white, in the white, the white, the white arrow shows the urban areas and we have the ecological corridors and ecological fingers. And so the two will meet together like that so that they, they, they're as close together as possible and so that the nature is right next to the built environment to provide ecosystem services. So that is the idea for this project. So this is the master plan we designed in the island of Red Union, which is east of Madagascar. And the idea was to have a series of ecological fingers. So you can see the fingers and then, and then, and then and going in on one side and the urban you know, realm on the other side. And so that in this way, you know, it, 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 it benefits each other. And then when, we're, when the roads that goes across our, our ecological you know, bridges, you can see in the, 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 uh, the green areas, which is connected along the waterfront, that becomes the spine from there, this becomes a corridor. And the rest of these are just ecological fingers and weaving into this is the built environment. So that was the idea that if we make them close together, and but that then the, the greenery will benefit. We will provide ecosystem services that provide oxygen, you know, it absorb the contaminants, produce pure water and so forth for the human for the uh, human human community. So this was the idea that you know, if we cannot reproduce it, if we cannot replicate ecosystem service ecosystem services, we should try and use nature to augment our systems. So this was the idea, and that you know where the edges are of the greenery, you know, links with the um, with the built area, we should not be linear, as you can see the you know the dagger. It should be jagged. It should be it should be weaving because this is this gives opportunity for species to hide, species to to, to ha create habitats, increase the, to create their own environment. Now, hydrology of ecosystems. What is very important, as I said, water is is a matter of life, and so with this earlier project, we had a water distribution system. But the white area shows the the um, retention pond, so the water is not just the rainwater then that goes on the ground, doesn't go to the drain and it's gone forever because once it goes to the drain, it goes to the rivers, it goes to the rivers, it goes to the sea, then the, the pure water, the rainwater is gone forever. We should try and collect the rainwater and bring it back into the ground. The water that falls on the ground should stay on the ground. So, so it's collected and it's brought down into you know, these sort of uh, devices. And that this is a diagram of what we should try and do for the internal areas. We should try and close the loop as much as possible. We should try and reuse the water cycle of water and we should purify it and the gray water should be treated. And, and, and until you cannot treat, retreat, use it anymore, uh, whether it's for urinals or toilets or cleaning or for washing, then outside the building, you should bring it back into the ground through biosphere and through constructed wetlands. And so if you like, this is, a, this is a cyclic process that we need to do with our systems. Now for the black water, which is the sewage, we should have a series of ponds so that you know, it's a natural process of treatment rather than mechanical process. So that by the time it reaches the last pond on the left-hand side, it is almost portable, it's almost drinkable. And so that, that is the idea. Now back to the idea of connectivity and nexus uh, of symbiosis, then, um, now nature you know, should try and integrate it as much as possible. And this is something I've been trying to do in our architecture. You know, the, you know, the symbol of yin and yang to the left hand side. Well, the right hand side are the four infrastructures, nature, human society, technology, and water. And we should try and, you know, diagrammatic, this is a diagram of, of, of my aspiration of something that I, I want to try and achieve you know, by design, which is extremely difficult. And then uh, ecosystems respond to climate. You notice those ecosystems throughout the world are not the same. In the tropics, we have one type of ecosystems. In the hot humid, you know, tropics, in the, in the temperate zone, in the cold climate, we have different ecosystems because the ecosystem, you know, naturally respond to climate, and in the same way the species respond to climate. 
And so what is if you look in the whole world, then you have, you know, you have the tropical belt and then you have the temperate belt, you have the cold climate, and that there are different, you know, uh, species and different ecosystems, each different habitats, you know, for, for, for each of these climatic zones. And so how do you respond to climate? So this is where designing for low energy comes in. Now, if you look at a temperate, temperate you know, climate, you have uh, a temperate locality, you have a cold winter and a hot summer, and then you have in between, you have what I call the mid seasons because spring and autumn, which are very nice. And so what we want to do is to try and optimize the mid season, extend as much as possible into the summer by natural ventilation, extend as much as possible into the winter, reduce the need for heating winter, reduce the need for, for air conditioning summer. And by extending this, then we reduce the need for, for air conditioning. Now, the first approach in low energy design is what I call biochromatic approach, where we, we design with the climate. By design with the climate, then we reduce the need, the need for, for mechanical and technological systems. But we should have no illusion that it is totally impossible through biochromatic design to imitate technology. Technology is that red line. Red line is consistent temperature, humidity, air change throughout the whole year. Biochromatic design can make it a little bit cooler, a little bit more, uh, uh, less uh, hotter, um, and by proper orientation, by proper shaping of the building, by use of natural ventilation and, and, and so forth, but it can never equate to the red line. So the next thing is to use some mechanical systems that are called mixed mode. Mixed mode means you can further improve it by using fans, by using uh, exhaust, you know, exhaust, uh, exhaust systems, you know, you can further improve it. So to try and push it as much as we can towards the red line. And then the next is to use productive systems through, you know, through wind generators, through solar, uh, you know, photovoltaics and through uh, you know, thermal systems we can get it as close as possible. And so this is what I call an approach to designing a net zero energy. You know, net zero energy is actually a misnomer because we cannot, it's impossible to get totally 100% net zero, but we can get as close as we can without, you know, to, to, to become a low energy building without the use of any non-renewable sources of energy. And so if you like this is the approach that we did and that, um, we should try and, as I said, mentioned, we should try and extend the mid-season as much as possible into the spring and summer. This is a project that we completed in London, which is the, uh, the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital Extension. It's off Guildford Street at the Bloomsbury area. And that what we did was to put a flue, a glass flue in front of the building. So it sucks the air up, you know, from the low, low street floors, which is, which is the cafes and, and the lounges at the top of the building. So that in this way, the, the mid seasons, the spring and autumn, you reduce less energy because the, these are naturally ventilated spaces. It is, it is cooler in the summer and it is a bit warmer in the winter. And so this reduces the heat, need for heating in winter and need for cooling in the summer. And so this is the idea of a glass flue on the outside of the building. You can see how the glass flue hits the ground and that, and that uh, this sucks the air up you know, to the top of the building. This is a building that we, uh, a renovation project we did in Beijing, which is cold climate. You know, Beijing is jolly cold, really cold, you know, during the winter time. And that is an existing building. And the idea was that we cut some holes in the sides of the building so, so that, you know, we bring the air in and we have variable walls to control the air going through the building. And then we create a flue, we create a funnel so that, that the air can go up. And so it's during the mid season, during spring and autumn, we actually bring the air in into the inside of the building. So the flu in this project is inside the building, but on the outside of the building. And uh, this is the master plan of the site. The red dotted line shows the green infrastructure that goes through the site. And that, um, and so, um, oh yes. The core position of a tall building is important. And this is the diagram that shows what happens, you know, on the top left is the core, is the middle. What happens the building is orientated a little bit to the right? What happens the building is, 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 has a larger surface on the right hand side? But the studies show that the core on the east side and the west side in the tropics, you know, has a, has, uses less energy than the one or the other forms. And so the core then can serve as a buffer between the inside and the outside. 
Now the darker in the middle is, is the sun part of the locality. The sun is mostly one third of the days on around the east side and not one third of the days on top and the rest of the days on, on the west side. And so this is the idea of the, of the building. And this is the building that we did back in the, in the late eighties. And the whole idea was to, 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 to um, and th this was this building where the cores on the east side and west side. Then we thought, what happens if we have a canopy over the building? Instead of having sun shading on the sides, what happens with the canopy? I call this umbrella building because, you know, umbrella actually is a really useful device because, you know, it's cybernetic because the wind blows on one side, you just tilt the umbrella to one side. If the rain comes from the other side, it the direction of the wind and then you can move it about and you don't want to, you can shut it. Now, this is my, this is my idea. If I'm able to design the building, which is an umbrella building, you know, it would be perfect for me. It would be like a major achievement. And so this is an example for a railway station that I did with a, with a you know, shaking umbrella. And, this, and, and the, this was a competition I did for the University of Malaya, where we tried to connect all the buildings together. And here we put the fritted glass roof over the university hub. And so you can see the fritted glass you know, as a pattern over the university hub. And this keeps the, you know, the building cool below and also serves as an umbrella and keeps all the rain and the sun you know, you know, during the, uh, keep out the sun during hot times of the day, it gives the rain when it's inclement. But this is another umbrella building we did in the East Coast, which is not, you know, not built, and it's a cross section of it, and it's the shape of it. And then we, I did this house back in 1985. Uh, it, it has a double roof, so the umbrella really is a louvered roof that's in the morning sun, keeps out the midday sun, and keeps out the afternoon sun. And so this is on the east side, you can see it's shaped to that in the sun. And then, you know, then the wind can go through the house, through the living space, into the upper parts of the building. It's the floor plan of the building. And it, it is almost porous. It is open so there's good cross ventilation north and south and east and west. And this is the passageway from the entry going up to the top. And this is the spiral staircase going up to the top of the building. And that, this is the passageway. And then we have what you call wing walls, walls which are on the sides of, of, of the building between the building and the fences that deflects the wind in the insides of the building. And then the walls of, of the spaces are, are, are not at perpendicular to the side of the building, but it's angled so that this blurs the difference between the, in the, the spaces between the insides and the outside. And uh, in the, the normal office building uses, as I mentioned, 131. This building uses about 42 per hours per square meter per annum. And it's right next to the forest. And what you see in this, this little red square, the little red square there is a monkey because we can see it right in the countryside. And this is a, a canopy, a just shaped canopy building we did over a railway station. And the canopy consists of little components that we just joined together. And this is you know, like a huge canopy building over a station, uh, which is not built yet. And so, you know, then the idea is to be, have what I call so you can see we go from the in the outside climate on the left hand side you can see the words outside climate the passive mode which is bichromatic design next one means partial mechanical systems and then the next is what I call productive mode where you start to produce your own energy and so this was an idea of I had where I have some better photovoltaics on the glass and that every of these panels cover about two floors and so like is um, it's a 16 story building with a photovoltaic. The whole building then becomes like a power station. You know, in this way, we don't, you know, it's energy efficient. Now we need to recycle and reuse our uh, materials. And, and I can only do a diagram because a lot of it is, it's not buildable, but you have to practice it. So now our building is the built environment, which exists in the biosphere. And it takes the inputs from the environment, from the biosphere, into the building and then it emits outputs on the outside, the outside. And so we need to so close the loop as much as we can. Within the built environment, we have to reduce the first environmental impacts and reduce the operational impacts and the end impacts. We have the inputs of energy, water, materials, food and people on the left hand side. And the outputs are energy, materials and people and transport and, and those systems. Then we need to close the loop. We need to recycle, reduce, recycle, and reconstitute. So in, in a nutshell, this is another diagram of what ecology design is about because the biosphere consists of ecosystems, the biosphere, global energy, and existing built environment. 
And we should try and you know, do all this in a seamless and benign way. And so this is as much as I can do up to this point in time. And that white square are those aspects of ecological design, which I haven't been able to achieve yet, which I'm working on right now. And that hopefully, you know, before I, um, before I end up pushing La La, you know, you know I, I'll be able to achieve this. Now, this is very important. What happens if we get our built environment right? We design a totally green built environment, totally green infrastructure. What happens if we get the water system right? But what happens if we have humans don't behave? We don't behave ourselves. We, you know, we are, we are wasteful in the use of materials. We don't care about energy. And so the crux of ecology is, a, is not the design, but it's us as human beings. We have to change. Our societies have to change. Our habits have to change. The way we move about has to change. And so at the end of the day, ecological comes back to us. We have to be responsible you know, people towards the climate, starting from ourselves alone. So now this is a diagram I did of different parts of ideas for an eco city, but it's too you know, tedious to go through this now. And that's the summary of what I'm going to tell you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for your amazing presentation. <laughs> a little, little bit speechless, uh, very interesting. Okay, the next agenda is Q&A session. Let me check uh, the chat column. Okay. Uh, the first question from Joseph Ebrian. Uh, I have a question about the key infrastructure. Why is water a separated K infrastructure from the nature. Uh, please, Dr. Uh, well, what is actually part of nature, but it's so important yep. that they can it outside because everything depends on water. Nature depends on water to survive. You know, we as human beings, we can do without electricity for a day or two, but we cannot do without water. And water has its own regime, its own hydrology. And that designing the water actually is the key fact in ecological design. And so I've taken it out. Nature means, you know, the ecology, the, the, veg the vegetation, the ecological systems. And although water is part of it, we take it out. In the same way that human beings is part of nature, we are one of the species in nature. But it is so important that it's a factor that we need to consider. So if you like, the division that you've seen there is an artificial division for the sake of design purposes. So water, as you say, it is part of nature, but we have to consider it separately mm -hmm. because when we look at a piece of land, we have to look at how the, what is the hydrology of the land, uh, in addition to looking at the natural aspects, the species, the vegetation, the soils, you know, the climate and so forth. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, yes. The next question from uh, Ratri Septina Saraswati. Uh, how to manage the insect to maintain comfort? Example, mosquito. Uh, actually, this is a specific problem in Indonesia. Regarding for building that has many opening window. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Yang. Please uh, uh, ask the question. <laughs> well, it is, a, it is an issue. That means, as I said, we want to bring some species back, but in those which are um, non-hazardous to human beings. And that, you know, how do you get rid of mosquitoes? You have to use mosquito coils or whatever, or use the electronic system. Now we mm -hmm. finished a, a 40 story building. And then the people at the top floor, the 40th floor, say that we got a lot of problems with mosquitoes. I thought, that's pretty weird. Mosquitoes cannot fly to the 40th floor. So how do we yes. stop mosquitoes you know, at the 40th floor? So I said, I'll spend the evening with you. So I spend the evening, look around, sussing out the whole place. I found the mosquitoes go up to the fourth floor 
in the same way the human beings go up the fourth floor. When the elevators come to the ground floor, the mosquitoes go into the elevator and goes down the top floor and goes to the 40th floor. And so mosquitoes, you know, you know, go up by elevators to the 40th floor. So to stop mosquitoes from going up the 40th floor, the mosquito calls the mosquito electronic machines in the elevator mm -hmm. so the mosquitoes don't get mm -hmm. to go to the mm -hmm. fourth floor. So these are some things you have to do, but you cannot let every species, you know, uh, ruin, you know, affect your, 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 your own environment. So you, some of these you can let in, some, some of them you have to avoid. So that, that's how we address mosquitoes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yang. The next question from Daniel Alexander is about geo-integration idea. Is it applicable in small scale projects such as a suburban residential area or housing complex? Uh, maybe do you have any design suggestion? Please. Well, um, everything starts with the site planning that you try and bring, integrate the green areas together, interlock them within a site plan with the hinterland. But then this is the problem because the, 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 the low cost schemes, the affordable schemes, is extremely difficult to design ecological buildings because you don't have the budget for it. You're already fighting to make the building as affordable, as low cost as possible. And so, you know, it's, you know, as they say, you know, it's not cheap to do an ecological building and that, you know, the higher the end of the building it is, the more budget you have to put ecological systems. The Solaris building, the building that has this spiraling ramp going all the way up to the top of the building was built at 6.5% over conventional construction costs for that building type. Now to justify to the client, we have to look at the energy and water savings and we conclude that the energy water savings is about 70 cents per square foot, and it takes between five to eight years to amortize the cost, extra cost of 6.5%. And so we tell the client, yes, you have to pay a little bit more to make it in a super green building because the, the building was in certified uh, uh, lead, you know, I mean, green mark platinum. But with the energy and water savings, yeah, you get your money back over five to eight years. But after five to eight years, it continues to get water and energy savings. And so mm -hmm. the service charge to your um, the service charge to your uh, tenants is much lower. And so, you know, uh, um, that is the commercial rationale for doing a green building. But you have to explain to people, you have to educate them. Doing a green building, not you should not do a green building for commercial reasons, not because you make money out of it, you do a green building because it's the right thing to do, it's an ethical thing to do. And because if we don't, as I said, we have only about you know 10 to 30 years left. Now, if you don't care for it and you don't do it now, all of a sudden it's all gone. You know, the, the, the whole world becomes uninhabitable. And that is something that we have to consider because you might think that tomorrow will never come. Tomorrow will come, it'll hit all of us suddenly in ways that we don't know there might be, you know, you know, more floods, there might be tsunamis, it could be, you know, global warming, you know, the, the seawater rises, uh, you know, uh, significantly. Those cities which are by the waterfront will suddenly find that they're totally uninhabitable. It'll happen quickly. It won't happen just, you know, it'll happen, you know, slowly, 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 suddenly, ooh, it's too late. And so, you know, we have to do something about it now. And, and that this is why it's so important that the next generation of architects, the generation of engineers, do something about it. Now, the tr now <laughs> and forgive me for saying this for, to my fellow architects, I've given up on my generation of architects because more, my generation of architects were not brought up to be literate in ecology. I had to learn ecology because that was part of my doctorate. But the next generation, youth, the young architects, the teachers should teach ecology at schools of architecture so that once you learn ecology, the whole perception of the world changes. You never see the world in the same way. And once you do this, then you realize how important it is to design ecological, you know, ecologically. But what I've done and what I showed you today is only a part of the tip of the iceberg. There's so much work to be done. There's so much research to be done, so much experiments to be done, so much testing to be done. I can never do this myself. I can never do it, even in my lifetime as much as I have, even have several lifetimes I can't do it. 
So I need other people like yourselves to help me do it, to, to, to do it, not for me, not for you, but for the whole world, for the benefit of humankind. That's what you guys have to do. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yang. The next question from Krisha Violeta. Yeah. Uh, it's about uh, our uh, stakeholder, the developer and investor. By looking from the developers and investor point of view, it could be said that by applying this eco way of building the ecosystem in one building is nothing close to cost friendly either from the GFA distribution building cost to even the building maintenance cost. Uh, do you have a perspective side how to accommodate this appeal, uh, Dr. Yang? Well, I don't know how to answer you. Um, uh, regarding you uh, green, how to. Yeah. You want to have a green uh, building, you have to budget for it. And you uh, must it, have to spend the money for it. And you have to just yes, have to yes, yes. through energy and water savings. So that's the only thing I, we can do. Just like, just like if you have a garden, you must tend to it, you must look after it. If you have a car, you must clean and wash it. But it's no point having a car that you don't have the, you know, you don't have the money to, to keep it clean or to operate it. So you have to think, you have to think holistically that, 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 that uh, we're not just doing one system, doing one building, but we have to in you know, the perpetuate look after it. We have to make sure the systems are running, the systems are in the right place and that, and that um, you, you have to be responsible for what you make. <laughs> That's all I can answer your question. Okay. Uh, okay, the next question from Jeremia Pasaribu. Actually, is a uh, Podomoro alumni. Yeah, recently uh, Jerry worked in Ong and Ong Consultant. Uh, Jeremia Pasaribu question, you have been working on ecological design for a long time. Yes. How has the client's view towards green architecture changed throughout your career? Well, some have and some haven't, but you know, it's very difficult to change people's mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you have to do it gradually, you can't do it over time. And so, um, and meanwhile, you still have to, you know, you have to keep your business going, you have to keep your staff happy, you have to design, you have to do all sorts of things. So that's why it's a miserable life in architect, you know? So those students out there, if you want to be an architect, think twice before you want to be an architect because can you imagine what it's like? You have to get the business, you have to do the business, you have to run the business, you have to finance the business. And meanwhile, you have to do architecture at the same time. And now if you do architecture, you have to do green art at the same time. And you have to please the clients, to please the authorities, you have to please, you know, you have to make sure the contractors does its work. It's a miserable life in architect. If I live my life again, I'll be a taxi driver, not an architect, you know, I'll be happier. So, um, well, we do it because it's a passion. We, because we want to do something for the world and that's why we are an architect. But if you don't have this passion, you don't have this ethical view about doing something for the world, then why bother? What do you want to be an architect for? You're not going to make an awful lot of money. You can make a lot more money doing something else, you know? So my advice to students, to architecture and to architects out there is it's not easy being an architect. It's not easy being green, as, you know, I don't know whether you, you ever you've seen the uh, you've seen the uh, puppet, you know, puppet puppet series called Sesame Street and and Sesame, the Sesame Street has the frog called Kermit and Kermit sings this song. It's not easy being green, and so it is not easy. It's been a, you know it's a difficult life, you know. So um, think twice before you are an architect. If you want to be an architect, you must have the passion for it. And you must, you know, you must do it for ethical reasons rather than just for financial gain. Okay, thank you. The next uh, question from oh, Kathleen. No. <laughs> so many questions. I think uh, the participant is very eager. Last, okay. last question, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the last question from Kathleen Charity. Yes. It's one of the best uh, final project on Podomoro University. Is uh, uh, she is our student uh, question? 
can you explain more about EcoCell and how exactly it applies to low, medium, high res building in a reducing heat? EcoCell is just a means for bringing vegetation all the way down to the basement, but it also provides the means for bringing daylight to the basement. But at the bottom, you have what you call a living machine, if you can, where, where it recycles the wastewater in, in a series of, of uh, Series of tanks. Now, this the living machine was invented by a gentleman called John Todd, where he has a series of of living of, of, of tanks for recycling uh, the grey water. But I haven't been able to do this hundred percent yet. So at the moment, at the bottom eco cell, I have the recycled water, or just, I just have a treatment pond, or I have a bioswale. And that's the best I can do at the moment. Eco cells, an idea of a cell. So it it is right at the base of the building. It's not at the top. Is that it doesn't depend on the height of the building, but it's actually you know to, towards the, the ground floor, it goes all the way down into the basement. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yang, for your presentation and sharing and <laughs> ask uh, much of many, many questions. We get lots of knowledge and experience regarding ecological architecture and sustainable design. It's yes. not only theory, uh, but also implementation on design. Well, thank yeah, you. Uh, I don't uh, make a conclusion, but uh, some lesson learned from the, your uh, presentation, how to integrating architecture and ecology include climate, biological, biotic, cycle, abiotic, geological, uh, mm -hmm. geological et cetera. And mm -hmm. the second uh, about bio integration concept considering nature, water, human, and built environment. And the last uh, lesson learned about, about con, uh, Dr. Yang explained very detail about key ecosystem attributes. It's very interesting. And how to implement it on design. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yang. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. Okay. Before we close the session, could you please give a few words for young architect, especially architecture students, to motivate them to create breakthrough and milestones to the near <laughs> future. Please. Well, I don't know if you've heard of a musician called Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones is not just a jazz musician, he, he, he's a he's arranger. His name is Quincy Jones, and he says two things. Once you start something, started doing something, mm -hmm. don't stop until it's done. Don't stop halfway. Then the second point is, is that when you do something, whether it's big or small, do it extremely well or not at all. And these are two things that I learned a great deal from him, which is the ethos of what we do. Once you start something, don't stop until it's completed. But whatever you do, whether it's a big task or a small task, do it extremely well, better than anybody else, or don't do it at all. So these are, this is my advice to myself, my advice to my people, and my advice to the students as well. Well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yang. And, uh, and Stay well, stay safe, and be healthy. Yeah, me right. too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much again, Dr. Yang, for your sharing. It's very useful for us. And thank you very much for enthusiasm, all participants. I'm very sorry we cannot respond to all of questions because of the limited time. OK, the next agenda will be back to MC. Please, Javita and Jensen. Thank you to Mr. Ken Yang for the knowledge worth of a lifetime. Now we are going to take a photo together to commemorate this event.
<laughs> Done from the tech okay. picture. I think the photo is already taken. Now we will present the redaction. Davita. Okay, the next agenda is I want to present the video about Padamura University's uh, Padamura Design Festival 3.0. Through our human existence, architecture kept on evolving. Due to civilization demands and peoples continue to evolve. Classic Byzantine, Romanic, Gothic, Baroque, Rococo art, Neville, Book art, Art Deco, Postmodern, and Dancing. Where are we now? We stopped creating history and no one knows for sure why. It may be because we lost track, or are we already in the last of civilization? There is no more boundary in time between yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Did we turn to be ignorant? Or did our beautiful world just stop spinning? Are we the ones who are responsible for this phenomenon? Thank you, and the next I want to invite the team of Warna Magazine. Mr. Winston Sebastian, time and place is yours. At the, end, at the end of this webinar, there will be a QR code for evalu evaluation form. And after you fill the, the form, the e-certificate will be sent through your email. Thank you so much. So uh, that's all for this webinar. Please scan this QR code. Uh, to tolong uh, mohon di scan QR code ini untuk uh, sebagai absen dan akan dibawa ke link form evaluasi webinar ini dan e sertifikat akan dikirimkan ke email masing-masing. We would like to apologize for the delay and any disturbance and any inconvenience to all participants and guests present. And we say thank you and goodbye.
please scan this QR code and it will lead you to the evaluation form of the event. After filling the form, the certificate will be sent through your email. Thank you. Kepada seluruh peserta, dimohon untuk men-scan QR code berikut sebagai absen dan form evaluasi webinar ini. E-sertifikat akan dikirimkan ke email Anda.